CQ Satellite, CQ Satellite, Kilo, X-Ray, 9, X-Ray, Rover, Kilo, X-Ray, 9, X-Ray, Rover, Echo Nancy, 2030, Gridline, QRZ. Hi, I'm Sean Kutzko, KX9X. Welcome to the sixth and final video in the series for DX Engineering on getting started in the amateur radio satellites. Today, we're hitting the road and talking about AM radio satellite operators' favorite activity, roving. So what exactly is roving? All roving is, is operating your ham radio satellite gear from a grid other than the one that you live in. Roving doesn't have to be a complicated endeavor. You can incorporate roving into another trip that you're taking for business or to go see family or friends. All you have to do is take your satellite equipment with you, whether that's an HT or two, or a, a, a linear mode satellite radio uh, and an antenna, and just put it in the car or pack it up in the plane, and uh, you can activate grids other than the one that you live in. I'm on the road here in central Illinois, so I can show you how you can find the line between two different grid squares and transmit from two grids simultaneously. We're also going to hear from four of the top rovers in the United States and get their perspectives on roving small and large operations. Hi, I'm Clayton, W5PFG. I'm Mitch Ehrenstorf, and my call sign is 80HJ. Hello, I'm Ruth, KM4LAO. Hi, it's Justin, uh, N5BO. Stay tuned, it's going to be a fun video. At the time, I had a job where I did a lot of traveling for work, and people were saying, hey, I need, I need to make contact with this grid square. And, and I thought, well, I'm traveling there frequently for work. So uh, first it became roving while I was on business trips, and then it became roving while I'm on family vacations, and then it evolved into dedicated roves to rare locations and exotic locales. And uh, boy, over time, that, that adds up. And and uh, just recently, I hit uh, 224 uh, grid squares of operated satellites from here in North America. I love the portability of being on satellites, the ability to do it from whenever and wherever I am. Mm -hmm. um, so it fits in perfectly with moving between home and the co-op job and school. Um, so I've been able to rove almost immediately as soon as I got active on the air on satellites. You know, just handing out QSOs, helping others. The aspect of uh, returning a favor for many of the guys that get out on the road and has helped me out since I started getting really active with SAS in May. I get out there and uh, I work a lot of QSOs and basically give out grids to people that's helped me out along with the other people that need grids. Best thing about roving, I would say, is just giving back, um, giving grid squares to the people that, that need it. Um, some of the grid squares I rove to, pretty remote desolate places, places like uh, North Dakota, South Dakota, not a lot of people going out there. So it's just nice to, uh, to go out there and give people the opportunity to work those grids. And the other thing about it that I like is it's, it's a good adventure. You get to get out of the house and see things and meet people that, um, you know, you wouldn't have had the chance to do or see. Um, and just the pure thrill of getting on the air and having a ton of people want to talk to you. <laughs> I love riding a pilot, it's great. Uh, 
I have two setups, one uh, strictly for FM, and that's based around the Kenwood TMB71 in a bag. And I will work FM satellites on that mostly. And the other setup I have is dual FT818s for linear satellites, along with a couple arrows. Yes, I have an arrow for FM. I have a linear uh, arrow for linear satellites. The primary is uh, the 9700, and I power it with a 12 amp hour bio Bioino uh, battery. And typically, I can get about 60 plus passes out of it without charging. So I can go, I could probably go a whole row depending on how long it is, what I even charge it. But I, just to be safe, I carry a backup and I charge the primary battery each night while I'm on the road. Mm -hmm. um, I also, I carry a backup gear set of uh, FT818 and a D74, which I've re replaced a D74 with an IC705 that I need to test out sometime this week. If I'm going to be doing FM passes and I go handhelds, I love my aero antenna. Um, with two handhelds from, I usually use a Kenwood THD 74 and ICOM ID 71A. Mm -hmm. Um, so FM, I like to keep it light so that, um, doesn't have to take up a lot of space, especially since most of my robes are with family. So, um, the, the little space is good. Um, if I'm doing linear satellites, then I will bring along my camera bag with, uh, two eight seventeens and a portable battery so I can do, um, more satellites. I have worked across the spectrum from everything with two handhelds to one full duplex FM handheld to uh, two FT817s that are very popular. Um, I've used dedicated satellite radios um, such as Yezu 847s or ICOM 910s or uh, now I rove with an ICOM 9700, IC 9700. So you know, it, it really varies. You, I've used uh, a lot of different rigs to to do it and been successful with all of them. So it really comes down to what the operator's preference and budget and and uh, what they're looking to do. I, I'm, I'm a fan of using uh, a dedicated satellite radio, but the downside to that is it's not quite as portable as, say, 2817s or, F, or 818s uh, or something like an 818 and a Kenwood D74. I mean, there's people using that combination for ultra light FM and linear satellite um, rover station. I always want to take spare equipment out on the roves. Um, if I'm somewhere far away from home, it's not like I can get that equipment right away. So the things I bring along, I bring along uh, extra arrow extra antenna, extra batteries, coax, voice recorder, batteries, you name it. Spare headset, spare Heil adapters, spare uh, PT switches. I primarily use the hand switch from Heil, but also have a foot switch I carry. Um, like I said, a spare battery, spare power cables, uh, two GPSs in case one dies, spare batteries of uh, you know, AAA, AA, Anything I can possibly think of, I bring a spare of it. So if anything breaks, I have a backup. I have a backup uh, arrow antenna that I carry that's still in, new in the bag. But at any point, if I mess up and drop the antenna and break an element or something, I have spares of everything. I think planning is the most important part of the rove. And the reason for that is, in my experience, there's been a lot of uh, that happens during a rove. You have people messaging you on Twitter, you have unexpected delays, things like that. So typically I'll spend two or three nights uh, figuring out the drive times, the actual location that I wanna operate from. I'll use Google Maps, Street View, any tool I can find to find a road or a location without power lines, uh, kind of away from, from people. But uh, yeah, no, you need to do a lot of, of planning. It makes things go a lot easier. And the nice thing about planning is figuring out your schedule. You can pass that information on to people and they know exactly where to find you and when it fits best in their schedule.
to, to contact you? Um, I use a variety of apps on my phone. So I like Maidenhead that gives me a good, um, I can live track where I am located at a particular time to give me the grid square. Um, I also use Ghost at Watch that also lets me update um, my location so I can make sure I know exactly what satellite passes I'm able to get on. Um, and then I use Theodolite, another iPhone app, which enables me to take pictures of my location and overlays the grid squares so that I can easily remember exactly where I am um, down to down to more than just the four digit grid square so that I can more accurately enter location um, data, including like the counties and some people like that. One, I would say, and it goes with planning, understand the satellites, understand the footprints, understand what satellites are currently working because as it, as it stands now, you know, we, we have some birds that aren't very healthy. Um, the X-ray whiskey board birds, for example, at some point this, this summer, a couple of the birds flipped to, to where they're, they're going on and off. They're, they're basically unusable, whereas a couple others started working again. So understand what birds are doing what. And don't always trust what the AMSAT status page says because hearing a bird and it actually functioning properly are two different things. And I, when I say understand the footprints, is if you're on the east coast of the United States, even the grids that aren't super rare that are saying a 70, 80% range of the grid master heat, grid master heat map, more than likely the guys on the west coast are going to want those grids. So get an idea of what satellites, what footprints will cover those. And RS-44 is a good one for linears to cover basically the whole United States. And at what point, say with AO-91, can I work the West Coast from further east in the United States, which is typically going to be, you know, around 10 to 15 degrees on the footprint or lower is going to get you further out west. So just get an understanding of what the birds can cover and, and you know, research which ones are actually working. And Twitter has allowed people to, uh, you know, create an account, follow active amateur radio operators who are satellite rovers, interact with them uh, to a degree that um, it's really one of the best platforms I've seen for it. And there's a lot of um, community activity uh, for rovers to post up information about their trips, uh, post pictures. People post their grid maps and say, here's what I need. And, uh, you know, you just see a lot of camaraderie and people uh, helping each other out, uh, activating grids. I, I'm, I'm a huge fan of it. The people that are very active in chasing or roving grid squares can be found on Twitter. Even tools like Gridmaster Heatmap, which will show the percentage of need for each grid can be found there. And a lot of times you get rove activations, uh, rove notifications, just by being on Twitter and following what's going on. Schedule changes are there. People are usually pretty good about posting their schedule, when they'll be available, where, where they'll be at, and uh, what their plan. So it's a good communication tool, good way to be engaged with the community. Why are grid lines so important? Well, probably the first reason is for a lot of people, they can get two new grids with uh, one contact. And if you're on an FM satellite, nothing says you're roving better than announcing two grids at the same time. So usually, even if they don't know that they need you, they'll give you a call just because they hear two grid, two grid squares in the same announcement. Being able to do a grid line operation basically allows you to operate for two grids at the same time, which minimizes the amount of passes you have to do to cover those two, two grids. Uh, everybody not, might not need those two grids, but it's nice to be able to cover the two. Um, it allows you to move on to a different area without having to spend, say, two days in an area or maybe a morning and an afternoon doing the two separate grids. The way I find the grid line is a couple tools. Satmatch com forward slash maiden will give you a good overlay and i usually couple that with google maps and couple that in use street view and find that but when i'm actually going out to the grid line yeah use the gps 
use the GPS to uh, find the exact location. And I like to document that too for, uh, for Twitter. So part of the fun of roving is transmitting from the line that distinguishes two different grid squares. But finding the grid line is a bit of a challenge. How do you find the grid line? I use an app on my iPhone called Maidenhead, and Maidenhead offers latitude and longitude readouts as well as the exact grid square that uh, you are in, and it updates that information as you are moving. So uh, we're going to go find the line between EN50 and EN60 here in East Central Illinois. Let's go. Okay, so you can see the longitude on the upper right corner of the app is decreasing. That means that we are traveling uh, eastward and we are getting closer to the line of 88 degrees west longitude. That is the line of longitude that separates EN50 and EN60. Okay, we are like right on top of the line. There we are. Okay, so that says right there, you can see it. it, says 88 degrees west longitude. So we are right on the line of EN50 and EN60. Okay, so now we have determined where the grid line is. We're standing right on the grid line between EN50 and EN60. So I want to make sure that I mark that line. Uh, and so I'm just going to go over here to the side of the road and I'm literally just going to mark out a line in the gravel on the side. The rules of VUCC state that you need to be present in both grids simultaneously from a grid line operation in order to give out credit for both of those grid squares during a, uh, during a pass. So I am literally going to stand over that line in the field to make sure that I am complying with that rule and giving out both grid squares simultaneously. This is very important. You can mark it with uh, traffic cones. If you have small traffic cones, you can put a piece of wood down, whatever you want to use to mark that grid line so you know where it is during the satellite pass. But it's important that you straddle that line and give out and, and be physically present in both grid squares so that you can legitimately claim that you are in both grid squares simultaneously. I would say in, in outside of equipment, uh, what makes a road successful is practice. Uh, and, you know, I say that as somebody who has been roving for uh, more than a decade, that it doesn't matter if I haven't been, um, if I haven't been on the air uh, for a month and I'm going on a rove, I need to get out and work some satellite passes before the trip. Mm -hmm. So I, I really say besides equipment, and besides mindset being, you know, ready and having a plan for how you're going to execute the road, it's just very important to go out and test your equipment and make sure you're familiar with that and what are the active satellites and how, you know, what are their characteristics? You know, it's, it's a lot like somebody might prepare for field day. You know, a lot of hams, they dust off their radio just to go to field day. I'm one of those that likes to prepare for field day leading up to it. And I feel the same way about roving. You, you really should, um, don't just plan a trip and stow your gear and go. Take out your gear, use it, use it on multiple satellites, make sure you understand how to do that, and then go on the trip. I would say practice in your local area first. If you're an operator that primary operates inside your shack with a fixed station, get out in your backyard, go down the road to Walmart, operate portable, uh, get used to your gear. That's, uh, that's a big thing. Understand your gear. And if you have backup gear to that gear, understand that. So in case something happens, you can, you know, move across the, the piece of gear with no issues. But the biggest thing is, is get the practice in and also don't take on something too big. 
myself, uh, the pileup situation, I've, you know, coming from a contesting background and just running endless pileups just on, on six meters and other bands, I was used to that. So that was not an issue. I always worked portable, so I was used to that also. But uh, I, I'm, I have seen some guys, you know, try to take on a road without getting the portable practice and, and clearly show. So you, you should probably be prepared before you head out. And if it means working that, you know, a grid that's not rare, just something next door, you know, that, you know, maybe in the 80s on a grid, uh, grid heat map, do that. You know, it'll limit the, the pileups. But there's, there's going to be somebody that needs that grid. So, you know, get the practice before you head out on, on a big trip. Be prepared. Know where you are getting ready to go. Um, Pop-up roads are awesome. And that's the way to start. Just if, it, if you're in somewhere, you're driving around somewhere and you want to get on the air and do it. Um, but once you want to do a dedicated road to drive places, um, or even if it's just dedicated road to one particular grid square that a lot of people need, um, be prepared, do some research on where you want to operate from. It'll help make it less It'll help make it more enjoyable if you have a general idea of where you want to operate from, if you have the time um, to do some pre-planning so you can work as many people as possible. Well, for your first row, my suggestion would be to look at Gridmaster Heat Map on Twitter um, and find a grid or a grid square that's, that's needed. Maybe something that's not too rare, but something that is not too... Uh, populated, something in the 60 or 70% range. And just pick a few passes, go out there for a day, announce it, announce it on Twitter, announce it to uh, Gridmaster Heat Map or the Grid Life and go out there and give it a try. Always make sure you're hydrated with water. I did not do that my first rove. I found out the hard way. And uh, bring the clothes that you, that, that, you're going to need for the trip. I'm, I'm from, I'm living in Florida. I could wear shorts most of the year and just, you know, you go north to here just a matter of a few hours to six hours. And that's not the case. I found that out. There's a lot of different ways to go about, you know, roving from the casual person sitting on the beach uh, with an umbrella in the drink and, and an antenna on the other hand to people that set up a field day style portable satellite station. There's all things in between and all are fun ways to enjoy roving on amateur radio satellites. And then try to work as many as possible. And like when, when you got a rhythm going and there people are being patient and letting you work each, work someone and then calling you again and letting, letting you get a rhythm going and bust out the contacts, it's great. It's, a lot, it's very, very fun. I hope you've learned a few tips and tricks from some of the experts on roving on how to do a rove for yourself. Again, it doesn't have to be complicated. It can be very low key. Take it with you when you go on vacation or visiting family or friends to the grid square next door. Be sure to subscribe to the DX Engineering channel here on YouTube. There's a lot of great information from a lot of very knowledgeable hams that will improve your ham radio know-how. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me on Twitter or send me an email. I'd be happy to help. Thanks for watching, 73.